How we all doing? Uh, so next we're going to talk about common elbow fractures and dislocations. Just a quick overview. First I'll cover the dislocations uh, and then common fractures that you'll see with or without a dislocation. So in terms of dislocations, the elbow is the second most commonly uh, dislocated joint in adults. The most common would be shoulder. Uh, and in children, it actually is the most common. Uh, these, these represent 10 to 25 percent of all elbow injuries, so they are fairly common. Uh, the highest incidence, we see this in patients 10 to 20. Just a quick slide on, you know, the ligamentous constraints of the elbow. So there's, there's primary constraints, which there's the bony ulnohumeral articulation, the anterior bundle of the MCL uh, here, and the anterior, and, uh, as well as the LCL complex. Uh, secondary static constraints include the capsule, the radiocapitellar uh, articulation, uh, and the flexor extensor origins. And then there's also actually dynamic constraints, which are the muscles that cross the elbow, such as the uh, uh, brachialis tancaneus. So in terms of the, the classification for elbow dislocations, just when you're kind of, you know, discussing them, uh, we base it on the location of the olecranon relative to the humerus. So most commonly, it's a posterior dislocation, which is shown in, in these radiographs here, where the, the uh, olecranon actually goes straight back, and you'll have the uh, distal humerus riding anteriorly over it. Uh, it's very important to get a lateral view uh, because, as you can see, the, you know, the AP view isn't always really clear what's going on. If you looked at this AP x-ray, you might think it's just kind of, you know, oblique radiograph, not a very good study. But then you look at the lateral and you see what's really going on. So these can be simple or complex. Simple meaning there's no associated fracture. Uh, and then complex that there are fractures also with the dislocation. Uh, this, this picture down here is just an example of something you've probably you know, thrown around, you hear thrown around a terrible triad, which is just a combination of three different injuries. You have an elbow dislocation, uh, the radial head fracture, which is visible here, as well as a coronoid tip fracture, which is, you know, this triangular shape of bone up here that uh, came off of its fracture bed down here. So on evaluation, there's, there's going to be some history of trauma. Obviously, this, you know, all, all these injuries I'm discussing, you know, somebody you fell or uh, got hit, was in some form of uh, traumatic incident. Uh, but you're going to see pain and swelling with the dislocation. There's obviously going to be deformity. Uh, you should be able to palpate. Uh, there, you know, the elbow will not feel like the other elbow. It will be, uh, depending on the direction of the uh, olecranon, uh, it's going to feel different. But uh, it's important you want to assess the neurovascular status, make sure that, you know, obviously there's intact blood flow to the hand. Uh, you can check the radial pulse, make sure there's brisk capillary refill, uh, check the motor exam and sensation. Uh, also, feel the compartments in the forearm. Make sure, you know, they'd probably be swollen, but you want to make sure they're compressible and uh, we're not worried about compartment syndrome. And obviously, look for open injuries. Uh, so, you know, those three things would constitute emergencies, in which case I would send someone immediately to the ER. Uh, and then you also want to look for associated wrist and shoulder injuries. Ten, 10 to 15% of the time, there's, there's another injury here. So in terms of uh, evaluation, like I said, you want to get good AP and lateral radiographs. Uh, not always, you know, they're not always good. Uh, you can consider oblique x-rays to look for uh, associated fractures that aren't uh, necessarily visible. And then if there are fractures, you know, typically if you refer them or if, you know, once I see these patients, I'll order a CAT scan uh, just to characterize the fracture further. Acute simple dislocations without associated fracture, uh, these are typically stable. Uh, so it's closed reduction, mobilization, splint. You want to do it at least 90 degrees because as, as the elbow starts to straighten out, uh, instability events become more common. Uh, so, that, you know, if it's, say it's a posterior dislocation, which, like I said, is the most common, generally you're going to pull in line traction. If there's any medial to lateral translation of the olecranon that you feel, you correct that, and then you're going to flex the elbow up and you basically apply posterior pressure on the olecranon to pull it forward, uh, and you'll feel kind of a satisfying clunk there. So uh, generally, you'll refer them to an orthopedist. We'll see them, uh, assess them, make sure there's no residual instability, uh, critically you know, look at the imaging, and then start early PT you know, within a week. Uh, the sooner you get these patients moving, the better they do. Uh, indications to fix these would be, you know, obviously, if it's unstable, it's not staying, staying reduced. If there's associated fractures, uh, or if there's uh, soft tissue or bony fragment within the joint itself. 
In terms of stiffness, universally stiff uh, is, is a complication. Um, most commonly, they lose a little bit of extension, particularly if they're immobilized, you know, longer than five to seven days. Uh, and then you can also have, obviously, neurovascular injuries, uh, post-traumatic damages to the joint, uh, as well as heterotopic ossification. Uh, next, uh, radial head and neck fractures. Those, these are also very common, 20% of all elbow, elbow fractures. Uh, typically, it's a ball on an outstretched uh, hand. Uh, one third of them, you'll have an additional either wrist, shoulder injury, or associated elbow uh, fracture dislocation. So you have to be kind of really uh, focus in on not just you know looking at that one part of the elbow. Uh, on exam, it's, it's pretty pathognomonic. They'll complain of tenderness on the outside of the elbow. You can usually you know have them pro, uh, pronate and supinate the forearm, and you know that that will hurt them. And you can you can kind of feel the radial head, and they'll be point tender right there. Uh, it's pretty clear clinically. Uh, so one thing you want to look for if if they say that they can't move the elbow or they're, they're not able to uh, pronate it or supinate it, and that's concerning for you know something that may be surgical, and you would definitely want to refer that. Uh, you, again, examine the wrist and shoulder. On imaging, uh, you can have uh, radiographs that are you know not really clear that anything's going on. But you know, similar to in, in kids, you want to look. They can have a fat pad here, where it's at the front and back of the humerus. There's a little elevation. Uh, you can see some uh, effusion within the X-ray. Uh, another thing you can do is get a radio capitellar view if you have a high degree of uh, suspicion, which is it's a lateral, but they angle at 45 degrees cephalad. And what that does is uncouple the radial head and the uh, coronoid, so that you can actually see more of the radial head without overlap. So this is the same elbow with a different view, and you know the fracture becomes visible. Uh, generally speaking, if, if a fracture is displaced uh, and it's referred to me, I, I will get a you know CT just to look at you know the level of displacement, as well as uh, to see how many fragments there are, and to assess the uh, congruency of the joint. Um, most of these can be treated non-operatively, particularly if they're minimally displaced and the patient has good range of motion. Uh, and they do well. So, um, you know, I'll see them in the office. Usually, you know, if they get injured over the weekend, you see them that week, everything looks good. I'll, I'll take the splinter sling off right away and let them start PT. And usually by six weeks, they're pain free and, you know, back to doing whatever they want to do. Surgical indications uh, anything that's really displaced, obviously, anything that blocks motion or complex injury patterns. So, if you have a radial head width, uh, a dislocation or something like that. Uh, there, the procedures we have for this are open reduction internal fixation where we fix uh, the fragment back with uh, either screws or a combination of plate and screws. Uh, if it's too comminuted and too multi-fragmentary, then we actually do a radial head replacement. Uh, and then rarely we do a fragment excision if it's a, you know, a really small piece or if it's an elderly patient. Uh, complications, so if, if a fracture is non-displaced initially, uh, it's pretty rare that it displaces late, so that's why we do start them moving pretty quickly. Uh, as with all these injuries of the elbow, stiffness is kind of the one thing that we're always looking for. It happens uh, more often than not. It's just a, a matter of what degree. Uh, and, uh, you know, if these patients get really stiff, then we can do uh, what's, you know, kind of a dyna We've seen the, like a dyna splint where it's static or progressive splinting to help uh, lock in uh, flexion or extension to try to get some more motion. And then, obviously, with any, any fracture that involves the cartilage surface, you can have post-traumatic arthritis. Uh, the, and surgical treatment, uh, the, the, main, the main kind of thing that we're concerned about is a posterior interosseous nerve injury because of the way it winds around the radial neck. Uh, it's right in the surgical uh, approach. So next, olecranon fractures. Uh, these happen one of two ways. Uh, typically, it's either a direct blow where you fall right on your elbow or an indirect blow where you fall, kind of brace yourself with your wrist. There's a, you know, eccentric contraction of the triceps and avulses off the olecranon. Uh, just a uh, slide on the anatomy. Uh, the olecranon and the uh, coronoid process, they form a semilunar notch here. This is the articulation with the distal humerus. They allow for flexion extension at the elbow and obviously add stability. They're one of the primary stabilizers. So on exam, the patient will have uh, tenderness right over the you know, uh, tip of the elbow here. You may feel a boggy kind of defect. Uh, 
if the fracture is displaced, instead of you know a sharp tip of the olecranon, it'll just be kind of mushy, soft tissue there, uh, and they'll have loss of extension generally. Uh, so if you you know have them try to extend against resistance, they won't be able to do that, or it'll be too painful to try. Uh, imaging once again, kind of the standard here is AP and lateral radiographs. Uh, once again, you want to get the true lateral. So non-operatively, uh, we treat these. If it's minimally displaced and the patient is, act, is able to uh, extend, so their extensor mechanism is intact. Uh, we also, you know, if it's an elderly patient, you know, 85, 90 years old, and it's displaced, it's actually been shown that you know, non-operative management of these, uh, they do they do pretty well, as opposed to going in there and subjecting them to a surgery and uh, hardware complications. Uh, so non-operative, you put them in a long arm splint, somewhere between 45 to 90 degrees, and then we. We'll start range of motion in a week. Surgical indications, uh, similarly displaced fractures or loss of uh, function. So the, the procedures we typically do, uh, more times than not, is an open reduction internal fixation. We'll do that with either a tension band construct with K-wires and a wire uh, or a plate or a uh, screw. Uh, rarely we'll do an excision and triceps advancement where we, you know, if the piece is, is pretty small, it's not really reconstructable, we'll just you know, excise that piece and perform essentially a triceps tendon repair. Uh, most common complication after surgical treatment is hardware uh, irritation. If you feel your, your lacrinon over here, it's subcutaneous bone, so it's really hard to put anything there that's not going to bother you. Uh, stiffness hurt, occurs in a lot of these patients uh, postoperatively. Uh, however, usually they have a good range of motion, which, you know, we consider anything greater than 30 to 130 to be able to do pretty much anything you want during your ADLs. Uh, these patients generally have more than that, but you know, that's kind of the worst case. Uh, obviously, post-traumatic arthritis, as the joint is involved here, and loss of strength. Uh, last fracture, we have the coronoid fractures. So these, these are kind of symbolic that there's been some episode of elbow uh, instability. Uh, and actually, if you have a coronoid fracture after dislocation, then you do have a higher risk of recurrence. Uh, it just signifies the uh, severity of the injury. These are traumatic shear injuries. There's actually you know, nothing attaching to that, to that little tip over here. Um, so the, the, generally what happens is the, it's a fall and the distal humerus drives through the olecranon and shears off a different size component. These are three-dimensional CAT scans showing common uh, patterns of the coronary fracture. In terms of the anatomy, uh, as we spoke of before, the anterior bundle of the MCL is a primary uh, static stabilizer of the elbow. Uh, it attaches to the medial facet of the coronoid. So you can imagine if you have a coronoid fracture that goes down and involves the insertion of the uh, MCL, then you're going to have significant instability there. Uh, it also acts as a buttress, uh, just, you know, the OSHA stability that it provides. So on exam, there's going to be obviously swelling, some bruising. So the tenderness of the elbow, it's, it's usually more difficult to, to really assess like an isolated coronoid fracture on physical exam than, say, a radial head or a lecranon fracture, uh, just because of the location of it. It's really deep. It's under the muscle. Um, so uh, you, what you may note is if you have them do a range of motion, you may notice a little bit of crepitus in the elbow. Uh, once again, you want to do a nerve vascular exam, as with all these injuries. Uh, and AP and lateral x-rays, once again, uh, it's, it can be tough to kind of pick these out, uh, especially on the AP, unless, unless it's a really large piece or involves the medial facet. Uh, you usually have to look at the lateral. Uh, on this view, it's this little minimally displaced coronoid tip. Uh, this is just uh, a 3D CT showing a uh, coronoid tip fracture there. So if the elbow is stable and it's minimally displaced, we treat these non-operatively. Uh, similar uh, brief immobilization, get them moving. Uh, if, it, if the fracture is displaced uh, or you suspect instability, then, you know, refer them, we'll, we'll assess. Uh, indications for surgery include persistent debility, uh, associated fractures, or ligament injury. Uh, the procedure would be address those other injuries as well as uh, fix the coronoid. Uh, we generally do that either with a uh, plate, uh, plate and screws, or even just suture, depending on the size and location. Similar complications to these other injuries, you're going to have elbow stiffness, recurrent instability, post-traumatic arthritis, heterotopic ossification. 
Uh, these are kind of things, all four of these, you mentioned to patients. Uh, as soon as I see them and we're talking about surgery, uh, you can do a perfect surgery and you know one of these things could occur. So kind of just overall, most double discations are stable after reduction. Uh, you want to confirm the, that it is in fact reduced with AP and lateral radiographs. You want to assess the nerve axis status and uh, you don't want to lock these patients up for too long. You know, sometimes they'll show up in my office like two weeks after dislocation in a splint and just as they said they couldn't get appointment and you know, those patients don't do as well. So you, you want to make sure that they see somebody you know, soon, uh, preferably within a week so that they can you know, evaluate them and get them moving with therapy. Uh, complex elbow uh, dislocations, displaced fractures typically require surgery. Uh, and you know potentially complications include, uh, as I've said, you know stiffness, persistent instability, post-traumatic arthritis, and heterotopic bone formation. Questions? A lot. <laughs>